Numa Pompilius was certainly a much different king than Romulus. He was a peaceful, disciplined, and very religious person. He detested war and was much more interested in furthering Roman culture instead of its borders. He was said to have created the Roman calendar, the office of the Pontifex Maximus, and the Temple of Janus. And yet, he wasn't even a Roman. Numa was actually a Sabon. So with the massive shoes of Romulus to fill, how did Numa do? Let's talk about it. Before we get any further into today's episode, I just want to quickly ask that you subscribe and like if you enjoy my content. It really helps the channel out and it motivates me to make more content. Also, follow me on Twitter to get updates about any videos in progress. Now back to your regularly scheduled programming. Numa Pompilius was actually born on the day of Rome's founding, April 21st, 753 BCE. A bit convenient, right? Anyway, Numa was a Sabine. He lived a life of discipline and few luxuries. He eventually married the only daughter of Titus Tatius, the Sabine king, Tatia. It would seem like his marriage was one of love, as after 13 years of marriage, Tatia would die, and Numa would be devastated. He would retire to the Roman countryside, where he was content to spend the rest of his life as a quiet farmer. However, those back in Rome had other plans. After Romulus' death in 716 BCE, the Senate and Rome's people were divided into two factions. One wanted to elect a Roman king, while the other wanted to elect a Sabine king. Because of this, the Senate actually exercised royal power for about a year. Remember that the Senate could only appoint an interrex, a type of regent, for a term of five days at a time. This meant that over that year, the person technically in charge changed every five days. Talk about serious turnover. Eventually, Numa's name came up in conversation as a possible compromise candidate. He was a Sabine, which would satisfy the Sabine faction, but he was also the former brother-in-law to Romulus, which would at least placate the Roman faction. And so, in 715 BCE, the Senate and Rome's people offered the kingship to Numa. At first, Numa did not want to accept. Not only did he enjoy his quiet life in the countryside, but he also believed that Rome was currently a martial society, and it needed a good commander as king, not a peace-loving and pious man such as himself. Numa would only be convinced to take up the offer after being visited by his father, his philosophy teacher, and two Roman senators at his home. We don't know what was said in this meeting, but we do know that after the party had left, Numa had given his tentative agreement to be king. Numa returned to Rome, where he was apparently greeted with enthusiasm from all of Rome's populace. He had only one request before he would take the throne. They must consult the gods first. This would further the precedent that a king of Rome must gain the approval of the people and the gods. The augurs consulted the gods and received favorable signs. And thus, with the approval of both the people and the gods of Rome, Numa Pompilius took his place as king of Rome. Plutarch states that Numa's first act was to disband the Solares, the elite cavalry bodyguard created by Romulus. We do have reason to doubt this, as later Roman kings would have their own Solares, but perhaps Numa only placed the Solares into a sort of limbo, and they returned to their normal positions after his death. In any case, this is seen as further proof that Numa was a much different king than Romulus. He was not interested in war. Numa was renowned among the Romans throughout history for his piety and wisdom. He was believed to have a direct and personal relationship with several deities, including the Muses, the nymph Igeria, and Janus. Plutarch suggests that Numa really played into these beliefs in order to push the Romans more towards a peaceful bearing, along with trying to instill the values of honoring the gods and abiding the law, and so on. In fact, this personal piety would be where most of Numa's accomplishments would come from. His most famous contribution would be the founding of the Temple of Janus. The gates to the temple would remain closed when Rome was at peace, and would only open when Rome went to war. For all of Numa's reign, the doors would remain closed. However, after Numa's death, the doors would stay open, nearly uninterrupted, until the reign of Augustus, the first Roman emperor. They would only close following the end of the First Punic War in 241 BCE, and after Augustus' defeat of Antony in 29 BCE. That should give you an idea of just how warlike the Romans were. Numa was also instrumental in bringing forth the cult of Terminus. Terminus was the Roman god of boundaries, and it was through him that Numa sought to instill a deep respect in the Roman population for lawful property boundaries. A traditional ritual would be conducted on each piece of private property for centuries afterwards, 
that would seal the boundaries to the property under the protection of Terminus. Typically, this ritual involved the sacrifice of a lamb or a pig, along with different crops, honeycombs, and wine. Terminus's protection would ensure that the property would not be trespassed, and any offenders would risk the ire of the gods. Another famous story from Numa's reign was that of the Ansil. The Ansil was a shield that apparently fell from the sky sometime during Numa's reign. When the shield fell from the sky, Rome was in the midst of a plague. A voice was heard proclaiming that so long as Rome held the Ansil, they would be the masters of the world. It should be unsurprising then that the Romans wished to take good care of this mysterious shield. Numa ordered another 11 shields to be built in the exact same fashion, so as to hide the true shield. He also ordered the creation of the Sali, a group of 12 patricians who would serve as priests of Mars and protectors of the 12 shields. These priests were dressed in archaic military uniforms, with a leather tunic, a breastplate, a short red cloak, and an apex, a type of spiked headdress. These priests would also carry the 12 shields during ceremonies. We do not know when exactly these shields were lost, but we know that we have no archaeological evidence for any of them, only written accounts. We do know that they seem to have been around during the time of Augustus, as one of his decrees was meant to introduce his name into the ceremonies performed by the Sali. In any case, these shields would go on to be very important symbols for the continuation of the Roman state. Of course, this is likely purely a myth. Shields do not often fall from the sky, after all. I believe Numa likely introduced these shields as a way to increase the popular morale during the plague, and as a way to ensure that at least some of his beliefs and traditions carried on. Numa also created several other priesthoods as well, the most important being the office of the Pontifex Maximus, the most powerful of the Roman priesthoods. I'm not going to go too deep into the history and powers of the office, as it really deserves a whole video, but the office presided over the College of Pontiffs, which included all of Rome's important priesthoods. The office was essentially responsible for upholding all of Rome's religious traditions, ceremonies, and festivals. The office's powers and responsibilities would wax and wane over the centuries and would eventually be absorbed into the emperor's titles. Numa would also bring the traditional Vestal Virgins into Rome. Vestal Virgins were priestesses of the Roman virgin goddess Vesta and were in charge of ensuring that the sacred flame of Vesta remained alight in her temple. A popular myth in the Roman period was that if the flame of Vesta went out, then Rome would fall. Numa also created the Flamines. These were priests who served a specific god. We know that Jupiter, Mars, and Carinus, or Romulus, were each served by a major Flamini. These priests were above the other Flamines and held special significance. The other twelve Flamines were assigned to various other gods and goddesses, including Vulcan, god of fire, Palatula, the guardian spirit of the Palatine Hill, and Ceres, goddess of agriculture. Two of the twelve minor Flamines served deities whose names are lost to time. These philanomies would eventually become very important for the Roman kings, as it allowed them to delegate the authority of presiding over religious ceremonies. Numa was also said to have been the person who changed the Roman calendar to the lunar calendar. He divided the year into 12 months and introduced the months of January and February. He also decided which days would be mundane or normal days, and which would be the sacred or important days. Much of these important days would be dedicated to various Roman gods. Numa's calendar would last, pretty much unchanged, until Julius Caesar himself would introduce his own reforms. Numa would die in 672 BCE, having never commanded Rome in a war. In many ways, Numa served as a polar opposite of Romulus. He was not interested in war or expanding Rome's borders, nor was he interested in personal glory. Instead, Numa served as the perfect example for how the Roman people should act during times of peace. He was respectful pious and law-abiding. Livy, Plutarch, and Dionysus of Halicarnassus all agree that Numa, in both legend and reality, gave the Romans their expertise in times of peace. Numa may not have been, and still might not be, as famous as his predecessor Romulus, but his moral, religious, and law-abiding teachings would last for centuries in Rome. He deserves to be remembered as a peaceful and moral king who attempted and succeeded in many ways and teaching his people about life after war. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something. Numa's reign is a bit all over the place, but I hope I did a decent enough job of condensing it and bringing it to you. If you have any comments or questions on the video, or believe I've made a mistake, 
please comment down below. And please like and subscribe if you enjoyed. It really helps the channel out. Peace.